Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this special bonus podcast uh, with Pinball Magazine's Jonathan Jewson and, Hello. Pin- and Pinball <laughs> News' Martin Ayub, that's me. And we are here uh, in this special interview to talk to Barry Dreesen of uh, Dutch Pinball, who I know um, has a, a really fascinating story to tell us and a lot of information to impart. And um, I know there are a lot of people out there who are very interested to hear what he had to say. So uh, good evening, Barry. Yes, good evening, Martin and Jonathan. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. So, um, for those who are not familiar on um, what has been going on and those living under a rock and, and such, um, Barry Dreesen is um, owner of Dutch Pinball, um, and Dutch Pinball developed a game called The Big Lebowski. And um, that's a title that was um, being, uh, the pinball community sort of was looking for a manufacturer to, manu- uh, to, to, to make a Big Lebowski game. And apparently none of the big manufacturers at that time were interested in it. And Barry and his friends figured, why not do it ourselves? Well, I'm not sure whether they thought that, but that's my interpretation. So yes. to give you a, really, we're going to give you a brief um historic timeline so to speak um yes uh well martin you did your homework yeah uh, the um first first uh, well not rumors but teases of the game came at pinball expo in october of 2013 when um barry and the app were there and were handing out flyers which uh, sort of had a game uh, a5 size flyers which had a game covered with a rug so you couldn't actually see what it was. Um, and the actual name of the game was not revealed at that point either. Uh, but it, it fairly soon became apparent exactly what it was, and it was the, the Big Lebowski. And it was also revealed that um, Dutch Pinball, who were, uh, who were well known at that point already for uh, their their work on Bride of Pinbot um, in 2.0, they had been working on uh, the Big Lebowski for a year prior to that and the game was actually first revealed to the public in september of 2014 at a launch party at the appropriately named lebowski's in utrecht correct yes yes and uh, what a fun night that was I'm, i think uh, i know jonathan was there and there were many it's around the corner in the dutch me. pinball community exactly mm-hmm. yeah I'm, I'm sure you had more than a little hand in uh, in arranging that as well i think it was me who mentioned to barry um that there is a lebowski's bar in utrecht which resulted in the lunch party being held there yeah, and uh, I was sufficiently enthused by the whole idea that I, I uh, flew over to uh, to be at the launch as well. So that was a that was a, a really fun night. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the uh, I suppose the next thing was the, the following month at Pinball Expo, one year on from the initial tease, where the first prototype games were shown, and uh, and of course you did your your seminar there to introduce the game to everybody. Yeah. Not only the seminar, there were also the uh, infamous penthouse parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. Um, there was uh, plenty of white Russians enjoyed all round and uh, multiple screenings of the big, the big Lebowski up in the penthouse. Yes, that was, uh, that was a fun time as well. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the result of those parties was that the, uh, the, the hotel in Wheeling uh, insisted that no longer uh, it will be allowed to have pinball machines in your room. Yeah, oh, exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, that, that's the reason why. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. so sorry, <laughs> folks. <laughs> really didn't sound like it was too much too rowdy there, but uh, with, the, oh, uh, with the games, oh, it was. <laughs> you left too early, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess if you if you were uh, renting one of the adjacent rooms, or, or indeed any of the ones underneath, you may have a different opinion on that. I suppose. Yeah, we uh, asked to join join us our party, but they were just mad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so, um, but soon after that, there was a, a, a falling out with Phil, who was running the US side of the operation, who uh, refunded many buyers' uh, down payments and uh, started a, a sort of a, a sort of a period where people were questioning the business practices of Dutch Pinball and exactly how the finances were being managed. And um, then in December 2015, there was revealed that um, 
the license for the Bukowski didn't include the use of any of the original artist's music, which uh, everybody, including you, I'm sure, too, Barry, uh, thought was included. So that had to be um, re-recorded with different musicians and vocalists. And then... Well, no vocalists. No, no. vocalists. Okay. Uh, so 20... Oh, it's all um, instrumental. Can I, can I uh, say something about that? Or yeah, absolutely. Or you want to just uh, do um, the timeline? Well, yeah, let me take it up to... Um, Take it up to June, um, shall we, uh, 2016, because in, in February and June you did um, two factory tours in uh, at ARA, at their facility in the Dutch town of uh, Alton, I think. Um, yes, now production, correct. The production schedule was announced as well with uh, building three machines a week initially. That's in um, through March and building up to five in, in April and then eventually up to ten a week by the end of May. And uh, in April of that year, the first games were shipped to uh, early achievers. Mm. And that was followed in June by a second factory tour. And so that's June 2016. Uh, uh, that's that's t Take the timeline up to there, because that's the point at which things start to change. But uh, let's go back mm -hmm. as well and, and look at... Um, at the build-up to all that, and and the launch, and uh, all the excitement and enthusiasm that was around in the in the collector community when that first yeah, yeah. was announced. Yeah, I think first of all, 2013. I wasn't there with Yap. I was there with Kun. Ah. I think we were just there to uh, show our uh, Bride Pinboy 2.0, and. I thought it would be fun if we did did some anonymous flyering about Lebowski already. You know, just to, to see how people would uh, respond. As you may recall, the flyers were anonymous, not from Dutch yes. Pinball. Right. I still, I still they were them. also handed out by, uh, by, by uh, girls dressed up in bowling alley outfits, something like that, if I recall Yeah, correctly. the bunny girls. Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah from, the, uh, from the bar across the, uh, the parking lot. No, no, no. no, no, no. I, I just uh, uh, found them online. <laughs> Ah. They were they were hired especially for for this purpose um, and to hand out the flyers uh, anonymously, so uh, that was fun. <laughs> mm. And yeah, wasn't uh, yeah was already involved with Dutch pinball, but not. Uh, I think we were not, you know, actually an a BV yet, which is uh, something like an LL LLC in uh, yeah. the US. Mm -hmm. And I was there with Kuhn uh, and and Scott, you know, just doing yeah. the brighter pinball thing. And it was only for a year later that we started the business officially with Yap, and then of course the uh, the launch party in 2014 with the with the parties. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which I have to compliment you guys on. I mean, um, I don't think I've ever seen another any other pinball machine make an impact like you guys did at Expo. Hmm. That was yeah. really, everybody was talking about that. People were lining up to play that game. You had three playing prototypes, if I recall correctly. Yes. And um, everybody was like amazed, basically. And the, the, the hype was really, really big at that time. Yes. Yes, fun times. <laughs> and and did, it, did that hype translate into orders in the way that you're expecting? Did you get pre-orders on those games um, in the numbers that you were expecting? Did you sell out all, all slots at that point? Um, or, or was it... Um, were the, yeah. Was it... Um, no, you, you tell us how it went. <laughs> I think at that point we, we took pre-orders for for the game only on Expo. I, th I think we said something like, we're just going to take pre-orders at Expo and then we're going to close you know, the, the early achiever list. So we right. don't want. We didn't want to to get too many orders to make it things uh, really complicated. After that, we we said, uh, okay, we're gonna just gonna take this group. We're gonna build those machines, and after that, we're gonna take more orders and build new games. So we said everything up to Expo will be early achiever, and after that, there's gonna be you know regular games, and right. we didn't take any pre-orders for that. So it's just uh, the, the early achievers. And, and how many early achievers were there at that point? Yeah, after the big uh, incident, um, I, I don't know. I don't recall how many there were. I have to look it up, but I, I don't know. Somewhere uh, two hundred plus or something, two hundred fifty okay. plus maybe. 
mm-hmm. I don't know the exact numbers. And I think after that, when we, uh, you know, we, we, we got some new orders in from people that got refunded, I think we stuck somewhere at 185, 185. Okay, that's, right. that's good. Yeah, so if I recall you, correctly, uh, um, sorry, carry on. not sure whether it's of any importance, but um, so at Expo, people were told um, that the uh, um, the early achievers that would be uh, what was cr- uh, the the people who, who uh, pre-ordered at pre- uh, Pinball Expo, but I think uh, two or three weeks later, the Dutch Pinball Open. Uh, was held and visitors of the Dutch Pinball Open could still get in on that early achiever deal, if I'm not mistaken. Could be. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> not that like important. Like I said uh, but in, in, the, in the pre uh, pre interview, I, my, my memory is not that good, and I don't have the timeline laying next to me. So uh, I, I think we might have, but but there were not many sales on um, DPO. So right. Okay. Mm. Probably because most of the people, the Dutch people or people visiting the Dutch Pinball Open or, uh, already showed their interest and ordered a game if they wanted one. So, oh well. Yeah. Oh. And, and did you think that, um, I mean, looking back now, do, do, you, do you think that that falling out with Phil um, had any material impact apart from the loss of a number of orders? Was that, was that in any way a sort of start of people doubting or, or um, losing their confidence in, in, the, in the whole project? Or do you think everybody who was uh, in after that point was, was rock solid and, um, and fully behind you? I think most people were still fully behind me, and, and most of them still are, because after my last um, <clears throat> newsletter I sent out, I got really positive feedback from almost every one of them. Um, of course, it wasn't... Uh, I, how you say, how you would say it? Universal, uh, I guess. No, no, no. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the the thing that happened wasn't you know nice. No, <laughs> it, sure. Uh, it was not something I planned for. Not something I expected. Um, I mean, it was crazy. And um, yeah, I I don't want to discuss too much detail about this. I mean, uh, <clears throat> everybody, uh, most some people know what happened. Some people uh, don't know, but. Yeah, it, it happened, and mm. I'm trying to forget it. Well, it's definitely something that Dutch Pinball moves uh, uh, forward on, so to speak. I mean, that's not something that, that affected what happened later, at least. Uh, no. I never understood it like that. So, no, it's completely unrelated to what happened later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That had nothing to do with uh, with ARA or something. No. Yeah. Okay. No, sure. Uh, but uh, but um, but what I'm wondering is, um, it seemed that up until that point, it was there was sort of unbridled enthusiasm for everything <laughs> you you had done. You know, everybody was so excited by the prospect of these games. There was no criticism that I could see anywhere. Uh, at least not not in any significant amount about what you were doing, how you were doing it. Uh, everybody thought you were, you know, the saviour of pinball, bringing out this wonderful license and such a great, great product. But then after that, there seemed to be a bit of, well, a lot of doubt introduced, obviously, because not everybody bought back into it. But um, I, I guess we can only really look at that in in retrospect. At the time, it was all such a crazy time that I don't think anybody really knew exactly what was going to, what the fallout from that was going to be. But uh, but the key thing was that you you still ended up with, or you say, 185 orders, uh, early achiever orders, at that mm. point, and um, and then you were um, well, basically you started building the games, doing mm-hmm. the factory tours, showing the people the games being built. Yes, I was, I was fortunate to be on one of them. I, I know Jonathan was on at least one of them, if not both of them. Yeah, and um, just for those not. Uh, completely familiar with the uh, with the story. Uh, what Dutch Pinball did was they um, and Barry, please correct me if I'm wrong, but they uh, uh, they started looking for a contract manufacturer that could um, uh, manufacture the game, assemble the game, and uh, basically do all the, the the hard labor, if you want to call it that, uh, assembly line, that kind of stuff. And they, um, I think they were talking to several parties, and eventually they chose um, a company uh, called uh, ARA or ARA um, and 
and well, let's take it up from there. <laughs> let's take it up from there. <laughs> um, yeah, because you were now talking about uh, the the factory tours, but they were you know much later. I yeah, think. Sure. Uh, I mean, when we started talking to ARA, it was yeah, that was even before. I think right after Expo 2013 already. Um, that was when we, you know, teased the game. We had some plans to, to build the game, but then we were still uh, trying to figure out uh, what company to partner up with to build the game. So that was eventually ARA. I think we had signed our first contract or something like that early 2014. And then, and of course, um, they were very enthusiastic about it. And, and we started building prototypes, showing them at Expo. Mm -hmm. Really exciting times because I think uh, everything, you know, was last minute, <laughs> like every good uh, project. And cool. yeah, of course. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think the first factory tour, Martin, correct me if I'm wrong, was in mm -hmm. 2015. Uh, I have um, February 2016. Ah, February 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then another one in June or something That's in right. the summer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got okay. it. Okay. Those, those, those first games, when the ones that were at the launch at Lebowski's, were they were they built by ARA or um, or were they hand built and uh, sort of like the the, uh, the sample games to show how how ARA should build them? They were prototypes built by ARA and us ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but at ARAs, and they were, how do you see it? We, we call them the, the primal prototypes. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> they were just more to, I think, see how the whole geometry of the game would work. And after that, if, if it would work, and, and they worked, uh, we would process them and you know do some tweaks and and uh, uh, build a real you know production model from that because i don't know if you ever seen the under side of the primal prototype but it was really Spaghetti? cable cable hell <laughs> it, was, it was not pretty yes yeah it was not pretty yes <laughs> yeah the top was but the bottom wasn't yeah mm. yeah Okay, so you've started building these. You, you, um, when we went there in fe in February, you were kind of just about to start building them, and uh, as I say, they had a, a production schedule ramping up, uh -huh. starting slowly with three machines a week, and then up to five, and then the, the plan of doing ten a week by the end of May. Right. Mm -hmm. If I may interject uh, here, it might be helpful for our listeners to understand that. Um, uh, at ARA, uh, ARA or ARA, um, uh, they assemble the games, but they are also, uh, for some part, a uh, supplier of parts in the sense that um, all the uh, the PCBs that went under the um, uh, under the under the playfield and po possibly also in the headbox. Correct me if I'm wrong, Barry. As well as the uh, the sheet metal used in the game and also the the metal parts to build um, the bowling alley were all manufactured at Ara as well. Yes, correct. Uh, the PCBs and sheet metal parts uh, were uh, manufactured by ARA. Uh, and there are no PCBs uh, from ARA in the back box, by the way, but uh, that's just a little detail. Okay. Um, so, Thanks, yes, that's uh, correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So, um, so getting back to this, um, you, you had a certain number of games which you were able to ship to early achievers mm -hmm. at that point. They were the first... That was that was who you were building the games for initially. Okay, you yes. taken taken deposits from them, uh, or in some cases, I guess, um, full payment as as games became due, uh, or payment became due on these games, and you shipped those games. How, how many games went out to early achievers um, in total? Do you know? Fifty five. Okay, that's good. So fifty five. That takes us up and up to i guess um so sort of after the second factory tour in june 2016 when uh the first problems appeared with mm -hmm. 
Well, basically, with the contract you had with with ARA. Yes, correct. I, I don't know exactly what you want to. <laughs> uh, what, what the question is, but yeah, the, the, the problem started around that time. Well, at the, at the sector, a second uh, factory tour, I know uh, some early achievers were present that were expecting or hoping to be able to pick up their game and unfortunately got to hear, sorry, you can't take your game um, because of a problem with uh, one of the bo- boards under the playfield. Um would you like to take it up from there, Barry? Yeah, there was one guy from England who came over to pick up his game. And it was very unfortunate timing that I think in the week before the factory tour, we had, you know, uh, there was the start of the fallout with uh, with ARA. So <laughs> the timing uh, wasn't uh, that good for, uh, for the factory tour. But yeah, we still thought, well, we will, you know, we will manage to... Uh, to come up with a plan with ARA and and we discussed with ARA as well to cancel the factory tour or just you know have it and and, and work things out in, in the the weeks after that and that was agreed upon uh, by uh, ARA and us so but they told us uh, that no game could leave uh, the factory unless we had a agreement and and then that's why we um, uh, how you say it? That's why we decided to um, uh, think of a reason why people couldn't pick up their games, or, or that guy. It was only one one person, one customer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, just 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 to add to that, it's just you know, we 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 we, we thought at that point we will only have a, like a delay of maybe a week, two weeks, because we were sure we, we could figure stuff out with ARA. Okay. Can you tell us about the, uh, uh, or give us some background info on uh, uh, what caused the issue between uh, ARA and, and Dutch Pinball? Uh, yeah, simple. I mean, what, what was the, the, the problem that arose, so to speak? Yeah, simple. Money. <laughs> uh, lack of it, or uh, because that's mo- <laughs> well, most problems, uh, of course, uh, start with um, money, <laughs> and in this case, it was. Uh, I think it most mostly had to do with um, pricing of the game. The, you know, the, the the price we were paying ARA. Right. We had, of course, we had deals in place. We had uh, agreements in place, and um, eventually it turned out that the game was more expensive than than everybody expected, actually. And well, yeah, you can understand that gives problems. That that generates problems. Right. So at that point, um, of the fifty uh, the fifty five machines that were shipped, were they all were are fully paid for all those? by that point <laughs> or were they still owed money uh, interesting question I have to uh, it's also something I my, my memory doesn't I think they they started uh, sending invoices way after first games were shipped right Okay. So, I'm, I'm just wondering whether their reluctance to release these games was because they were uh, the ones that they built uh, was because they hadn't been paid in full for the ones that they had already already shipped. No, I, I, of course we, we we paid a lot of money to them for R and D, so everything was okay. I mean, uh, I think at that point we were still working very positively together, and everything was good. And, and also, you know, the, the the people involved at ARA, the management, and and the, the director, they all thought it would work out in the end. That was, you know, something they would say every time. Komt goed, you know, it all will work out. Mm-hmm. And well, when they, of course, uh, after they shipped the first games, I think they really started to do the math on you know all the invoices and all the hours and and everything that wasn't in, uh, needed to build games. And I think they they uh, had quite a shock to see that it was much more expensive than they expected and that we expected, of course. 
And did that have to do with um, uh, materials being more expensive, or was it that the time uh, needed to build a machine was longer than uh, they estimated? Yeah, I think a little bit of both, but probably parts. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it's kind of surprising because they are have always been uh, sort of promoted as a a very experienced contract contract manufacturer who you know they do this kind of stuff day in day out for various customers you know they know what they're doing they can cost it all up and they find out that actually it ended up costing them a lot more than they expected yeah. sounds a bit no it sounds surprising that uh, they hadn't kind of done their done their maths on this <laughs> and worked out what it would cost them to build the game yeah, that that's something uh, we we of course uh, said many times before. That you know they are an experienced company. I think mm. they they are like you know sixty or eighty years uh, history. Um, but like you know, some wise man once said, making pinball is hard. <laughs> and even if you have a company which with many years of experience, it still is very very hard. Yes, harder than anybody thinks. Yes, it is. And harder, harder means more expensive, in most cases. Yes, and I think uh, I think you know when you, when you when you talk to people about building pinball machines, everybody's you know always you know oh, making a pinball. Oh, how hard can it be? You know, but I think when you really dive into all the details, um, and, and you show people the the bottom side of a play field and and the internals of of a of a pinball game, they slowly start to understand that building a pinball machine is hard and you know with all the different materials you have your wooden play field with plastics and then metal parts and then and, and especially the wood it's always a little bit different you, you have to, uh, some some margins and stuff like that and it's, it's also uh, really a uh, very uh, time consuming uh, production I mean you have to do literally, literally everything by hand yeah sure yeah. So yeah. Okay. So what was it they actually? I mean, the the figure of that's been been mentioned many times. I think is they wanted another one thousand euros per game. Yes. From from you, um, and you were obviously well. You as in Dutch Pinball were reluctant to to, to pay that, as you had a contract with them for mm-hmm. a, a certain price, and. Um, and they, they presumably just uh, wouldn't budge and said, "No, you've got to pay the money, or uh, we're not building any more games, and you can't have the ones that we've done." Is that correct? Is that a kind of a brief <laughs> a brief summary of of, of the dispute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know that number is out there, and of course, uh, yeah, they, they wanted more money for uh, for uh, building the games. Well, that number uh, came from from Dutch Pinball. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay well yeah it was through in, in several <laughs> seminars <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well yeah did that. sorry yeah uh, nah. <laughs> okay okay um so yeah it was around a thousand euros more than uh, than agreed upon and uh yeah what what <laughs> what can i say about it <laughs> well but um if the, the way i understood it uh there were actually two price in, uh, uh, increment um, at first it was like a thousand and um, I do recall some sort of story that at first Dutch Pumble went along and then Ara tried to crank up the price even more and that's when you guys said like no it's got to stop yeah I think um, first in first calculations we, we came up to a price and I think that the the first official agreed upon number, which was higher than the, than the first calculations, uh, but it was okay for us to work with. And eventually, after you know the first games were delivered already, they came with uh, a new price. And and still we were uh, we wanted to accept it, but only this time we we said, well, we can accept the higher price. It's still okay for us because we this is just how much we want these games to go out but we only expect, accept this new price if you're going to deliver by the end of the year so that was you know like like the first time we ever had you know something uh, 
like a like a I say a foot uh, in the door. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, to, some to, leverage to, over to, them. Yeah, yeah, put some leverage, you know, put some pressure on them because, yeah, you know, and and I think you know when they when they start for, uh, sending invoices, um, it was already clear to us that they would never uh, could met the deadline we put on them. So then we asked, well, yeah, start uh, crediting your invoices and uh, and and you change it to the old price. And that 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 never happened, right? So, um, the, the um, I think we're talking about now 2017 was somewhere uh, in in that period mm-hmm. of time, uh, yeah. because I think the deadline was that that all games were supposed to be built before the end of 2017, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was before the end of 2016. Mm. Yes. Ah, okay. So, um, um, that would obviously, uh, for ARA, mean that they would uh, probably have to put more people on the assembly of uh, Lebik Lebowski, but that never happened. Because if you want to speed up the process, there's well, the, you put more people to it, so it goes quicker. At least that's how I look at it. <laughs> Yes, of course, uh, more people can uh, do more labor, but uh, you also have to, uh, you know, source all the parts in, in time. And, yeah, but I mean, if you just scale up uh, from 10 to 20 people, uh, you also have to, to have the parts for it to to do so. Yeah. so. Right, sure. Right. Okay. But now, the, so when this, when this um, I suppose it all came to a head with the, with uh, around about the time of the factory, the second factory um, tour in um, in June uh, 2016, at that point, were our because uh, I, I was looking at pictures of that and there seemed to be like no no building going on anymore of games during the tour. There were, there were lots of parts all around, but I didn't didn't actually see anybody putting manufacturing any game, no assembling anything. So at that point, had well, I guess. I, had production stopped, then had those uh, had the games which they built with, which couldn't be picked up with those the last ones to have been built up until well now I suppose. <laughs> um, I am honestly have to say that I don't know. I think they still started building after that. I think ARA, ARA also thought we would work our problems out and then we could just you know continue building games. Um, so I just don't know exactly. Okay. So I guess that takes us through to the end of the year then. When, um, when I mean, actually, let me just ask you this question because it's, it's something that, that somebody has asked me that they wanted to ask you. Um, when you when you said that there was a problem with the board, and that's why the game couldn't be released, and obviously that wasn't wasn't actually the truth at that point. Did you? And, and and you said just now that you didn't think it was going to be a big issue because you thought you'd sort it all out and nobody would know anything any more about it. Do do you do you regret having having said that? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm laughing, but it's not funny, of course. But <laughs> it's such, such a. I'm sure you've been asked it a few times. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, next. <laughs> no <laughs> red card. I don't answer this one. No. <laughs> I will answer it. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, of course I regret it. I mean, it's. Uh, I think um, I, I know some people uh, think we're liars and, and, and you know try to uh, con people and our uh, Ponzi scheme or whatever you call it. Um, but of course, I regret that that stupid uh, stupid. Mm. How you see it? Uh, well, an excuse to excuse, yes, excuse to buy you a little time. I suppose. Yes, and, uh, exactly. Like I said, I was we degree. were. Yeah, I, I, we had some problems, but I thought, yeah, well, okay, we, we had more problems in, 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 the, in the past. We will fix it, you know. Um, that's always, I think, every problem can be fixed. And I'm, I'm normally, as you might know, pretty positive about stuff. So I thought, well, come on, this is going to be, you know, negotiations for a week, maybe two weeks, and then we can start again. And then nobody will never ask about uh, that mm. again. And of course, when it took longer, well, People uh, and people started emailing ARA about it. Uh, that's when, uh, of course, people found out that there wasn't a problem with the board. 
but it mm. was just some some stupid excuse we we thought uh, to to win some time. Yeah, sorry. It's, no, no, it's, no. I regret it, but yeah. Sure. No, I understand. Um, so that obviously things have become a bit mired by that by the end of the year, mm. and it didn't look like you were going to you know, come to a you know, an agreement with ARA anytime soon. So that's when you started looking for an alternative contract manufacturer, and uh, and um, and you found Zytec in in China, mm-hmm. and started working with them. Um, do you want to tell us about um, kind of at what point you decided you know this is we got to we got to move on we got to we got to find somebody else to build these games and you kind of almost gave up on working with ARA or at least used that as as leverage. Uh, to try and come to a, a deal with them, with ARA, yeah. No, oh, no, we didn't use it as leverage to come with a deal with ARA. We we just thought at that at that point that we we uh, were stuck uh, with ARA, and, and uh, we did. Of course, we we tried numerous times to negotiate again with them, but it just didn't work out. And that's when we decided. Well, um, th- there might be an option to see if we can build them somewhere else. So you've identified Zytec as being a, a potential contract manufacturing partner, uh, and you went out to China to work with them in setting up a, you know, or start setting up a production facility out there. Um, Correct. How, how did that go? Yes, it was uh, <laughs> my first time in China. Um, how did that go? Uh, yeah, so so I'll first. Uh, I think I was contacted, you know, more like like uh, uh, incidental by by SciTech. Okay. Um, and it was, you know, right at the time that that we thought this is never going to happen with ARA. So, well, maybe yeah. they are uh, the new guys who can do this f- for us. And and uh, and of course, like everything in in in. in in the beginning, it, it started all like, you know, fun and games. And yeah. uh, I went there uh, for two weeks, I think, after, of course, processing bill of material uh, quotes and stuff like that, and to to see whether we could um, uh, build a first prototype. And we did. Mm-hmm. And uh, then... <laughs> and then, <laughs> yes, let me <laughs> let me think about that. I think, yeah, I think after that we had a SciTech game and uh, ARA game at TPO Expo, like you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier. Yeah, in Eindhoven. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and they seemed both to be well, they were almost identical in terms of build quality, as far as a player could see. I don't know what what was the difference underneath the playfield or in in the back box. <laughs> But uh, they both played very well. It seemed to be a, uh, at that point, seemed to be a viable means of, of moving into production or returning to production of the game. Mm-hmm. But but it didn't. It didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. I think it, it was mostly because uh, at the time we started with uh, with SciTech, um, there was no, we were not, how do you say that, subpoenaed by EARA yet. So that mm-hmm. that actually happened um, during our startup phase with SciTech. So that obviously became a, a problem when uh, when ARA uh, dropped a lawsuit. I say no, no, dropped. Yeah. you know, uh-huh. filed filed yeah. us or mm-hmm. filed a lawsuit. Yeah. And I think the. the, the uh, the reason that it didn't go through with SciTech was uh, mostly financial. Right, the, the cost of starting up, yes. and uh, and the free cap, the free money, or the you know the capital that you had available in order to uh, start manufacturing. Exactly, the investments involved in that, yes. Yeah, and because of the loss, it was of course complicated. Sure. So, what tell us about this this lawsuit? What what were what were ARA claiming? That, that you owed them money for parts and production, or was it was it yeah. that simple? Yeah, that simple. Yeah, basically uh, just uh, money. Right. Okay. Right, because at that point, uh, for ARA, they still had a bunch of unpaid invoices, which they'd like to be paid for. 
or is that too simplistic? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's part of it. Yeah, of course, they 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 uh, uh, there were unpaid invoices. There were you know a lot of parts sitting in their warehouse. Uh, well, well, that's about it. So that um, that situation kind of stagnated for well over a year, I guess, mm-hmm. um, until what the beginning of, of this year, in 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 reality, when yeah. Yeah. when things started to sort of reach a, some kind of a conclusion, or the I suppose it went to court and uh, and a judge started to uh, sort of tell you guys to bash your heads together and come up with a solution. Exactly, or, I think, yeah. Yeah, or the judge would rule, and, n- and neither of you would want that. Yes, I think the, the hearing in the court uh, in the court uh, was on Santa Claus, <laughs> December 5th, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, which is a Dutch holiday, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, not and, going to discussion uh, of that, but... Uh, <laughs> Right, and that's uh, and then we're already uh, in. Uh, we're talking December fifth, two thousand eighteen. Yes, correct. Yeah, that's something I learned from this project. That uh, if you, as, as soon as there are legal battles, it's going to take a lot of time, and a lot of money. Right. So, but, but you you couldn't build any more games at that point because you hadn't got a manufacturing partner and uh, mm-hmm. ARA. ARA and you were uh, in a legal dispute, so they weren't going to be building any games. Mm-hmm. Um, you were presumably, I say presumably, but uh, for what you've said, you were you were confident of your case here in that you had a contract with ARA to build the games at a price in at a uh, maybe not at a time scale because they I guess they didn't they didn't sign that that uh, deal to get it done by the end of uh, twenty. Um, what was it 2016? So you you thought that your contract with ARA or ARA was uh, was pretty pretty solid, and that you'd be successful in uh, in any legal battle. Is, is that is that a reasonable summation of your position? Yes, yes, that's that's correct. I think uh, we had we had a strong case. I mean, of course, it's always you know if there's a fight, there's always two stories. But and of course, yeah, you know, we have our story, and we think our story is is uh, the correct one. And it, it, uh, what, what what did I want to say about that? Um, 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 uh, well, I I'm not sure whether I can mention this, but I know that you prepared a lot of. Um, um, documentation for the court case um, to to show to uh, a judge of uh, what had um, yes. happened prior to that. Obviously, there, there's a lot of time that involved in making all that documentation, um, uh, etc. Um, yeah, exactly. That, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, there was, you know, uh, not just the contract, but there were, of course, obviously, so many emails and and agreements and stuff that we talked about, and on how on planning and pricing and stuff like that. It was not only the contract uh, mm-hmm. that we put in in our, you know, uh, how you would say it, um, your defense, well, uh, oh, my defense, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, well, uh, eventually it turned out it wasn't enough. Um, being right and, and, and getting right is a different thing. But yeah, I'll, I mean, it's what the judge rules, and it's something you you cannot do something about it, or you have to go into a, into the appeal, right? Yeah. Into appeal. Now, sorry for interrupting, but um, uh, so we're jumping very quickly from uh, the start of this court case to. Uh, the judge ruling, but uh, the way I understood it, that took actually quite some time. There was quite some time in between where the judge on multiple occasions said, like, well, you guys better try to figure it out yourself before yes. I do a ruling. Uh, can you talk uh, uh, tell a little bit about that? Because it might be very difficult for people to understand why it took so long and and why a judge would say that. Obviously, you can't speak for the judge, but... <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's very complex for me as well. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, up until this uh, court case with ARA, I've never 
ever experienced something like it. So I didn't know what to expect. And I always was under the impression that, you know, when you go to a court case, you do your story and there will be a decision. But that it will would take, I don't know, like three, four, maybe five months uh, until there was a decision. It was something completely new for me as well. Of course, when we thought she would do, uh, it was a female judge, she would do a, a, a ruling. She obviously told us that we should go back together and speak to each other because she, she thought uh, that we we were obligated to each other to, to finish this project. And of course, at that, that point, we, we still wanted, yeah, we still wanted a solution. I mean, so, so we tried, or we talked to them, but uh, at that point, it was clear that they didn't want to build the games anymore. Um, right. Okay. Can, can, can we just um, sort of, you know, just put this in context for a minute, because uh, it, you're talking about how much time all this is taking up and resources as well. You know, obviously dealing with all these things isn't isn't going to be cheap either. Right. Hold on, it, Martin. It, we, we, we lost Barry. Oh. oh. I, th- I thought you could say Gary was calling. No, 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 no. Uh, no, Barry left. So. Sorry. Ah, my there you phone, are. My phone, <laughs> yeah, sorry. My, 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 That's all right. Uh, my cat jumped on me and my phone dropped. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's perfectly allowed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, let me just pick up where, where I was. Uh, I was just, uh, yeah, so I was just saying, I think it's important we, we put this in context um, because dealing with all this, you've already explained how how much resources, uh, how much time and um, and money it takes to to put together your defense and to go through the whole court and, and legal pr- proceedings. Mm-hmm. Was this your full-time job or did you have some, other, were you actually, you know, do you have a, an employment elsewhere or self-employed or, or, or was uh, Dutch pinball your, your life at that point? Well, Dutch pinball was my life uh, uh, when we were still, you know, producing games with ARA. Um, I've always been self-employed for the past I don't right. know, 50, 15 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, when the, when the problem started with ARA, uh, we stopped um, collecting money from the from Dutch pinball, and we had other resources to, you know, to make a living. Right. Okay. So you, you you were you were working elsewhere, you were freelance or as, yeah, free, self-employed. Self-employed. Um, in, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so this was in addition to your to your employment, your self-employment as well. Then you know, having to deal with all this and and family commitments too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it's a, it's a hard time. You know, <laughs> I have to, I had to switch back to to what I was uh, doing before I did pinball. So yeah. So you you get to uh, when was this March when um, when the judge ruled and mm-hmm. um, yeah, as you said it, it went in favour of ARA um, what what was the what was the nature was was there nothing in the ruling for you it was basically you got to pay these guys and that was basically you know the very short version of it <laughs> uh, i think you know uh, judges and 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 uh, legal uh, people uh, normally take uh, a lot of time and a lot of pages of text to to say something uh, very simple uh, mm-hmm. i think that the whole uh, verdict was like seven pages or something but i think 90% of it was just you know uh, legal gibberish that is just needed when you do a verdict so um but basically, yeah. it was uh, yeah, we were in favor of ARA and and uh, and, uh, and, and in, in, uh, it was totally in favor. There was nothing. Didn't say you know ARA owe you anything or they need to give you anything. It was it was all one sided. It was all one sided. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that that so, must have been quite a surprise. Yeah, how did you I feel? mean, if I, I was I was going to say you you were very confirmed or uh, or uh, you firmly believed that you had a very solid case. Yeah, I mean, of course. Uh, I was really shocked when my uh, attorney called me and told me this was the verdict. I mean, I, I was like, wow, is that the only thing? It's just, you know, yeah, 
uh, 100% ARA, 0% Dutch pinball. And yeah, basically it was, was like that, yeah. Okay, and uh, was there any uh, reasoning in hindsight that, that uh, this, this could have been, uh, have a different outcome if um, the matter that the court was ruling on was um, um, formulated differently or uh, in different words, uh, that, that the wording would be different in order to... to um, or, or was it, was there no way to to um, to to turn this around? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, <clears throat> I thought you know our defense on paper was really good, and but it's also a bit more complicated than you know if if one party says well they owe me money, and the other party says yeah that might be true, but and then there's a complex story. Mm. It's. I think it's all. It all has to do with how you interpret um, our story. Wow. Yeah, that's called context, and that's up to context. The judge to do. Yeah. So, but um, in the end, it turns out basically the judge ruled like, okay, you guys owe these. Uh, uh, you owe them money. They want that money. You have to pay them. That's a very long story yeah. short. Yes. Mm. And of course, you you haven't got the money to pay them what's what's um being decided in their favor so you have to come to we have to either go into bankruptcy and shut everything down mm-hmm. or come to an agreement so exactly. what, what what was your obviously you don't want to go into bankruptcy but but what was the what was the process what was the thinking about what you could, might be able to work out uh, such that you can you can come out with you know, both sides can come out with something yeah, exactly. I mean, that was, of course, uh, a real uh, setback uh, for for me and and, and, and for Yabo for for the company. Uh, and it was also right at the time that that Yab got ill and ill again, and and so that was uh, you know especially hard yeah. uh, at that point. And <clears throat> I think um, I have to think about the time. I don't know how, how the time mm-hmm. exactly goes, but but I think it was. Um, right after, of, no, no, right of, around the time of the verdict, um, a, a Yap uh, decided to leave the company because, you know, uh, well, because of yes. the illness and he just sure. uh, didn't want to spend time uh, uh, on all of this. And, and some people might think that might be, you know, the easy way out because, you know, oh, leave the company, you have a verdict. But that's not the point because if you... Um, <clears throat> If you bankrupt, uh, if if a company gets bankrupted, there will be uh, you know some some uh, attorney who is taking over the business, and they will see if there is bad management. And if you had bad management, they will come after you, even if you have left the company. So right. there would be no risk for me that yeah, would leave the company or something. And and of course, our all of our bank accounts and all statements and everything, every all of the paperwork you need to get done if you are. Uh, a company in Holland uh, was uh, in perfect order. So mm. we were not afraid that if we would go bankrupt because of the verdict, that they would come after us personally. Right. But did you, th- when you heard the ruling, did you think, was your initial reaction, oh, that's it then, that's the end? Or did you, were you still confident you could, you could come to some kind of agreement? Mm, that was difficult because... And I didn't know that either, because at the point the verdict was there, they could have, um, uh, shall you say that? Uh, the, the I right, could have executed the verdict and they could have, yes. enforced yeah. the uh, ruling and uh, demanded the full yeah the full, the full sum. Ma- the yeah. full sum, yes. And if they, they would have done that at, at, at the exact same time, that would inevitably have led to our uh, bankruptcy. No doubt right. about it. Mm-hmm. So um, why? I was always tempted to ask why. You, why do you, do you think they didn't do that? Why they didn't do that immediately? Yeah, yeah I, that's that's a good question. That's uh, something my attorney uh, also was. Uh, uh, he, he didn't know either. I think at that point I might have sent an email to the person involved uh, at ARA, who you know was handling the the case, that I still. Um, 
want to come to some kind of agreement even now uh, especially now when, right. when yeah. they obviously have had, had won the, the court case yeah. um, if I may something uh, um, if I recall correctly um, you could still appeal against the court ruling so that might also be an explanation why Ara didn't execute the uh, um, or uh, uh, insist on you guys paying because uh, if you'd still appeal then you don't have to pay yeah you have to <laughs> ah. that's something people don't know but I can tell you <laughs> by experience <laughs> that once you have a verdict which is uh, immediately uh, executable you can execute the agreement and we have to pay and, and if you do a appeal it's going uh, yeah, it's going to be something different but then you have to pay and if you go bankrupt in, in the meantime and you can't do the appeal anymore well that's bad luck mm. I mean how much how much of this do you think is a it's just it's just business you know it's um, it's what uh, what any company who were facing making well, potentially making a loss or not getting the same income on their manufacturing that they're expecting and and how much do you think it's uh, maybe like personality led because there have been some changes of management in in ARA um, since the start of the uh, disagreement and towards the end you're able to come to to some kind of uh, agreement with with um, I assume a different group of people who you were dealing with at the start yeah, and in the whole court case, I wasn't dealing with people from ARA, but I was dealing with um, the people in a holding, uh, right. in a holding group of okay. uh, ARA. Yeah, above them. And w were they cons were they the same people all the way through then, or uh, did did they change as well? Because I know I know the matter of the sort of management of ARA changed. Uh, the people yeah. you who you first you know, were first demanding the the extra money were, weren't there for that much longer. Yeah, I think one one guy left the company, and but well, he was that one guy was the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, he was the CEO, but still, <laughs> not like so, someone on the assembly line who decided to to go somewhere else. <laughs> No, yeah. well, all I'm getting at was 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 it was it him that was or somebody else who was just saying you know we got to we got to charge more money and we're not going to take no for an answer, or was that kind of like just the, their policy anyway? Wouldn't have mattered who was in charge. I don't know. I don't know any details about that. I don't know why they decided to do do, do so, but but eventually uh, the the whole uh, when the court case started, it was um, not the people from ARA but from the holding. Right. Okay. So it was, it was yeah, it was kind of uh, all went above their heads and right. And uh, so, I guess, yeah. I um, speaking of the holding, and I, I might be jumping a little bit backwards now in the sense that um, um, at some point um, you tried to negotiate with um, uh, Ara or the people from that holding that had taken over after the CAO had left. And there was a situation where uh, there was a proposition, if I'm recalling it correctly, where um, the, the the holding company that owns Ara uh, was interested in a 51% uh, ownership of Dutch Pinball. Um, obviously, uh, in the end, you decided not to uh, um, uh, to act on that and or or sell the company. Basically, is there anything you want to say about that? Uh, do you recall anything about that? Well, I recall everything about that, but it's not something I wanted. It's, I mean, yeah, we had some discussions about financing, and and they 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 wanted to finance, but they would take a part of the company, and obviously we didn't want that, and I still don't want that, and so that that were the negotiations that also ended uh, without a, a good end. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's um, let's just sort of just do a bit of a recap at this point as, as to where where we are. Um, so the, the ruling's been handed out. The, the you you have shipped fifty five early achiever machines. Mm -hmm. uh, you you um, owe another probably a hundred and thirty or so um, to people who have paid in part or in full. In the factory, there are. 40 machines in box, 40 complete machines in mm -hmm. boxes. 
and a whole bunch of parts to make a hundred or more other games. So that's that's what we're that's what the stakes are at this point. That's that's what you're you're looking at, and that's that's the basis on which you are able to come to an agreement with ARA and uh, start to so basically to to get those all that stuff out of the factory in exchange for some kind of payment to ARA. Um, the yeah. details of which I don't suppose you want to furnish us with. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, um, I think yes. About a couple of months ago, you know, I was there was all this negativity we already talk about for about an hour now, I think, mm-hmm. and uh, we we lost the, the the court case. Yacht was leaving the company. And I think at that point, I thought, well, this is not going to happen anymore. I'm a normally a very very positive guy, but and I always see solutions. But I think I was uh, I, I reached a point where uh, uh, you know the end of my rope or something, mm, how you call yeah. it. Yeah. And I I had prepared uh, a very well, quite long newsletter, and and I was uh, I had everything prepared to 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 take down the the websites and and social media pages and stuff like that. I think it was a Friday, and I was literally about to press enter <laughs> on on that email, and then I decided to to step away for a few minutes to think about this, mm-hmm. and I thought to myself, "Well, I know I know myself, you know," and I th- I thought, "Well, if I look back to this in two or three years, or maybe five years." I will never, uh, I say it, um, be able to live with yourself. Yeah, something. Yeah, exactly, something like that. Be able to live with myself if I didn't do just you know one more stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one one last shot. One last shot. Yes. Yeah. So I, so I, I thought, well, um, screw it, <laughs> um, and. I'm going to to call the person involved myself. No attorneys. No, no, no. The, 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 I don't have to do, to discuss with Yap. I don't have to discuss with anyone. I'm mm-hmm. just going to call him. I'm it's gonna the pers- person at the holding company. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes right, right. And it was actually pretty funny because um, I called him. He didn't pick up. And uh, I don't know. Half hour later, he called me back, and he thought uh, he. He didn't know it was me he was calling because he didn't have my number in his phone. Right. So I said, yeah, yeah, it's Barry from Dutch Pinball, you know. He said, oh, yeah, okay, okay. So, well, I basically uh, told him uh, that, that I want to come to an agreement. And it was, yeah, well, it was the, the first time that uh, that I, I think he ever, uh, for the first time, they, they wanted to, to discuss it. So I made him an offer directly on the phone. And he said, "Okay, I'm going to call my uh, my associates, and I'm I'm, I'm going to call you back uh, later this day." So later that day, obviously, I didn't send a newsletter at that point. Yes. <laughs> um, he called back. He called me back, and he said he they they all agreed on um, on my offer. And that was like I think one of the most bizarre moments in, yeah. in the in the, in the uh, I mean the last three years I guess. No, that, was, that, that raises a whole bunch of questions. Really, <laughs> um, I mean, had you had you guys hadn't spoken before this, or had you? No, I think that was after the hearing in the in the how you say it in the, in the, in the, yeah. the court the court room. Right, I think. So, we, oh, yeah. After that, of course, we we did have some discussions, but but that didn't uh, uh, lead to something. And I think that was the first time in months that I have uh, spoken to him directly. And I think it was the first time I spoke to him on the phone because he didn't have my number in it. So, so, so all all the previous discussions had been between lawyers, then had it? Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, y- you must have. Um, must have been amazed that it was that easy. 
it was, yeah, like I said, it was a complete <laughs> shock that, that they actually agreed on it. It's so, really, yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, uh, I perfectly understand if you uh, don't want to uh, mention any uh, financial numbers. Uh, but what it what makes me wonder is is um, the uh, the amount of money that you offered Ara was it anywhere close to what you were owed, uh, um, or or um, or was it way off? And um, is the, with with all the inventory and so on. Um, well, I would I I don't want to discuss uh, details on amounts of money, but uh, I I say I said I was shocked, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, the obvious question there is, how did you come up with this number that you offered? You know, um, and did you at that point, you know, were, you obviously weren't expecting them to accept it, but at that point, were you, did you actually have a means to to pay that? Or do you have is a plan? That, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, of course, I, I was thinking about plans uh, for months, you know, what if we do this? What if we do this? What if we do that? Mm. And, and, and that's not, not something, you know. So, uh, yes, of course, I did have a plan. And, of course, I thought about it a lot. And and now was the time that I, you know, just had to uh, had to communicate it with, with them. I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I was, you know, it was just a last shot, you know. I yeah, was thinking, well, what, what, what kind of plans to do, do I... So do you, well, you got nothing yeah. to lose, so you might as well give it a shot. Yeah, I had actually nothing nothing to lose. Yeah, of course I had a lot to lose, but nothing to lose uh, in a, in a business way because if you mm. if, if we would have gone bankrupt, that would have uh, meant that Pimble was you know uh, would be gone, but that wouldn't affect me personally as much as some people might think. I mean, you are you know you're protected in, in, by Dutch law, and and it, of course it would suck. Uh, I mean, a bankruptcy it wouldn't be fun, you know, dealing with all kinds of people you don't want to deal with, but. It would be okay for me, but of course, in 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 the, in the weeks prior to to this telephone call, of course, I had uh, tons of plans, but I I never thought one of them could actually work. So when I called them, I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna take the best plan I figured out in my head the last couple of weeks, and I kind of present it to him. Okay, so That's so what happened. How- how detailed was that plan as as regards how you were going to raise the money, what you're going to do with the machines, what you're going to do with the parts? That was was that all part of the initial plan, or was it just literally uh, we'll pay you this and we'll we'll get all the all the machines that you have, all the parts, uh, we'll ship them out and we'll we'll call it quits. Yeah, basically. Yeah, of course there were the, there are a lot of more details in the yeah. back of my head, but but for them it was just you know this is my offer, take right. it or leave it. Well, and that's for, for the machines and the parts, and and that, that's it. And then anything after that, we can work out later. Yes, yes. So, uh, so basically, uh, I give you this, and with that I, I get all the stuff that's Dutch Pimble related from you. Mm-hmm. The court case is off the table, obviously, yeah. Yeah. and. Yeah, after that we we you know and we, we and mm-hmm. were the, were the, were the, the thing that springs to mind when we were talking about court cases and settlements is a huge amount of legal fees involved in sorting all this out because it's been going on for well for almost two years mm-hmm. by this point and to keep I, I know there hadn't necessarily been that many um, court hearings but I'm sure there've been plenty of letters backwards and forwards between both parties. Um, so that, that you, legal fees can often eat up and you know, or dwarf the actual cash amount of any deal. Uh, was that a, was that a problem here, or was that was basically each side would deal with their own? It's just a one one off payment, and you pay your legal fees, we pay our legal fees, and that's it. Yeah, basically, I mean, I I think uh, they're they're. Counter offer. Oh, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, I know. They, of course, when I when I did the offer, they did a counter offer where they said, "Yeah, we want our legal fees paid." So mm. they added that to the amount. Um, right. What I could tell you, legal fees in Holland are. Uh, I mean, they are high, but they're not as high as I think they are in other parts of the world. Right. right. Okay. Okay. So if we are. Um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, filling in some of the blanks um, and trying to look at this at, uh, from the point of view uh, from Ara, um, you're about to throw in the towel, so to speak, and um, um, basically um, either they can execute the verdict and uh, uh, try to collect the money, causing a bankruptcy, um, but that would also cause a problem for ARA in the sense that ARA still, in case of a bankruptcy, ARA would still be stuck with a bunch of games and uh, a ton of parts that they have no use for. So would mm -hmm. that be why you think that they eventually figured like um, if he takes all that stuff away from us, that's no longer a problem of us. He can figure it out. We, we take this and let's move on. Or were there other um, um, reasons involved as far as you know? Well, I can speak. I, I can't speak for ARA, but uh, I think it might have something to do with that. Yes, but uh, I don't know. I think uh, they uh, they also uh, are very relieved that we now finally have a, have an agreement. And and actually, they are uh, when I deal with them now, you know, for for picking up the parts and picking up the games and stuff like that, they are uh, really uh, forthcoming. So. So we're now at the point that Ara, that you and Ara agreed on on um, uh, a settlement, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. and and at that point you have to figure out, like, okay, I have to come up with a sum of money uh, mm -hmm. in order to make this work because if you don't, then the deal is still off the table. Yeah. So uh, obviously this is um, a very recent history, but. Um, um, can you talk us through what what you figured? Like, okay, how can we, uh, or uh, uh, you in this case, um, uh, come up with the money that uh, is agreed on, and then, uh, and what are the plans to move forward? Because um, then, uh, besides that, there's like uh, that there were forty games at Ara. There's also a ton of parts. Um, enabling you to uh, to build games and uh, a lot of people um, are curious like okay so what will be the next steps uh, mm -hmm. and will you be able to to build games or will you look for another contract manufacturer and uh, <coughs> what are your plans okay well Yes, it's, it's all very recent, so I, I, I have a, a good knowledge of this, of course. Right, um, and I hope this turns out to be the positive yeah. part of the podcast. <laughs> right. Yeah, let's, let's, let's take that um, in, in small steps, first of all, shall we? About uh, starting, first of all, with, with what, you, you know, what you're going to do with the, the, well, the goods that you bought, which were, what, 40 pinball machines complete, mm -hmm. a number of incomplete games... No, but you, well, you tell us what it is that you actually got as part of this settlement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, we got uh, 40 almost uh, complete games. I think there were like, uh, I don't know, 32 complete games that were uh, tested by me and, and yeah, back in the days uh, at ARA. And, and they were completely boxed and ready to, to, to go out. And there were also, I think, eight games, about eight games that were... Uh, test that meant at ARA that meant that uh, they had done all the testing from a checklist mm -hmm. we, we made uh, back in the days yeah. and that was the, the final step before our final testing and final testing meant that Yap or me would test the games right. and so after they, that so, yeah. so they had all the parts in the game yeah, yeah, yeah they were completely completely done right okay so, so 32 and 8 right okay mm -hmm. And besides that, there were also uh, uh, some uh, other uh, almost complete games. And, well, of course, we had a look at Factory before we signed the, the new agreement for this deal. Uh, and we had a look to see all the other stuff. And mm -hmm. Jonathan was with me. Yes, uh, yeah. I was there. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come <laughs> with you at that point. And as, as Jonathan can uh, attest, yeah, it, it, there were a lot of parts. <laughs> yeah, um, I think in total with um, 
Uh, in meters, I think we were looking at 7 by 32 meters. Um, so I'm not so good in inches and so on. And I, mm -hmm. uh, math is not my uh, uh, my strong point. But um, well, multiply by three for feet. So uh, 21 feet by what was the other figure? 30 meters or 20? Th seven by, seven by 32. So if okay. we're talking, so if we're talking square meter, so like twenty-one, like twenty-one by a hundred, twenty-one feet by a hundred feet. Right. So that's two hundred like twenty-four yeah. square meters. Um, um, and I, so I have no idea how to multiply uh, that into uh, uh, square feet. But sorry, what what is this? This is parts laid out on the floor somewhere. No, this is parts or boxes. Box up uh, crates of parts. Uh, boxes of parts uh, uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, the games that were boxed up as well, as well as a, uh, um, a few uh, games that weren't uh, in boxes, uh, but the, or or, or uh, just empty cabinets. Um, and that was all just in one part. And then there was another part in the factory where um, all the glass was stacked on 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 pallets. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the the wood to make cabinets wasn't even part of that. That was also in a different part. Um, the uh, rotisseries for the assembler line were also in a different area of the factory, and that yes. was all part of the deal. So, um, so so we're looking at um, what we estimated at the time, probably six or seven truckloads. Right. So so Barry, you, for my Outsider perspective, this all seemed to happen very quickly. Once, mm -hmm. once you come to an agreement, well, once once the judge's ruling really had, had taken place. Yeah. Um, did you, and then, and uh, do you even now know exactly what it what it is that's in that in that part inventory as regards what you need to build games? Uh, how much how much of a complete game is there in in parts? Do you know that information yet, or are you still trying to trying to get a grip on, on what it is that, that you've got? Well, I have a list. They did yeah. a, a, a count uh, after a, uh, everything went south, or how you say it. Mm -hmm. And so I have a list of those parts. And, well, of course, I could only briefly check it in, in the, the few times we were there in the, in the last past months. But from that, I can do a a guesstimate of how many uh, games I, I can build from that, yeah. And I and I, uh, um, I know back in the day that we, we place an order for 300 games. Now, roughly 90 uh, or 100 are made. So, and, and in some parts, they, they bought in, in uh, for all 300 games. Mm -hmm. and some, parts were, some parts were also uh, bought uh, lean, or how you want to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in batches of 20 or 30 or 50 and so at this point it's hard to say how much exactly I can make from the parts that are there but I think um, after we pick them up and we can do a, a, a really good count of the parts we, we can actually uh, say how many games we can already make from the from the stock that we have now right so let's um, let's go back to the point where the agreement was signed you'd You'd visited the factory, you'd seen the games in boxes, you'd seen the parts. The race was on to try and get things out of the factory as quickly as possible. I guess Is, the race was on, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but I guess the race was on to get the money before. Uh, because if you if they wouldn't be paid, I don't think anything would leave the factory at that point. Well, that's a, that's a good yes. point. And, and we can, we can yeah, but let's look at that. You were our... Uh, very much of the opinion that you had to pay them up front before you could get anything out of the factory, or that were was they? The agreement. That was okay. So then, so you had to do a lot of a lot of fundraising in order yep. to 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 pay that. Um, yep. Had you already got all this in in mind? You know, we were talking earlier about whether you had a plan. Uh, yeah. Uh, when when uh, they su surprised you and accepted your deal, um, did you? You you did you have funding agreements or you know outline ideas in place of how you're going to do this? Well, yeah, like I said, I thought about it a lot uh, to to what if 
to to, mm. to what 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 would what would be the what if scenario if they would agree with you know <laughs> with a, a proposal for me. Uh, so yeah, I had uh, thought about that, and I had uh, I, I, I contacted people uh, even before um, about this, and once they agreed, well, I could basically air quotes just call them and say, mm -hmm. okay, we have a deal, <laughs> and I had some uh, I, I funded the I raised the money with uh, uh, some some investors and paid off ARA. Uh, by the way, that, that went to. Uh, a third-party account, so that was also in the agreement that I would pay the amount to a third party, and right. they will release the money to ARA as soon as I have all the stuff back in my possession. Right, so uh, ARA can't turn around and to go, oh, we've got the money, but you're not taking the parts or the machines. Exactly, yes, yes. And that was a contract <laughs> drawn up by our attorney, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but we we know how much that that can be worth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay. So um, um, the uh, uh, so so you were looking to to raise money um, to pay off Ara, and uh, this is around the time when um, Coin Taker started offering these uh, forty games. Um, is there anything you want to uh, can you talk about that process how that went um, and um, uh, obviously I can understand that it makes uh, how it would make sense um, but it only makes sense if you have a future plan to um, because obviously there's still about a hundred something people waiting or early achievers waiting for a game Um Something needed to happen. That's for sure. I can I can understand. Um, but these people are still waiting. Like, okay, it's very nice to see that the games that were ready are now moving to other people. But what about me? Yeah, <clears throat> totally understand that question. Um, well, like I said, I I, I had a plan. Um, I, I th thought about this uh, a lot. Uh, to figure out what to do as soon as there was a proposal that they would agree upon, and well, luckily it happened, and and I got uh, the money funded. And of course, I, I knew I had the, the forty games, which uh, represent a certain amount of money. <laughs> so that uh, was kind of the easy part. Of course, the the the, the next part is okay. Now I have all this uh, these parts. I will have them soon, and they will be transported this week. And and what's the plan? Of course, I want to uh, build games. I want to uh, build games uh, for early achievers. And to do so, I think yeah, we have to find a, a, a like a modus operandi uh, to <clears throat> to see how many games we have to sell to new people uh, to fund uh, to build the early achiever games. And that's something we we. Uh, of course, we have you know calculations of that, but it's something that that we have to work out in the in the next couple of weeks or months. Now, do you when you were um, coming up with the plan to to sell the forty games, mm -hmm. and now as I said, that all happened very quickly, or it mm -hmm. certainly seemed to, and they sold incredibly quickly mm -hmm. through Coin Taker. Was any consideration given to offering them to early achievers first? Because I know a number of them have said to me, you know, if if that had been offered to me at $12,500, I would have bought it. Uh, it would have meant I was in for 20000 or 21000 But I would have a game. And if nothing else happened, you know, if Dutch Pinball couldn't go into building anything, I'd have a very rare game, which would probably be worth twenty twenty one thousand. 21000 So I wouldn't lose out. Whereas what actually happened, of course, was Cointaker just sold the whole lot in a matter of minutes and <laughs> early achievers well some early achievers may have got in there through coin taker or, or, or not but they weren't given any sort of preferential treatment do you think that would have been a a good move on your part to to you know because you are effectively selling games which they paid for hmm. uh, in the expectation they will get their games eventually but it would have been a good publicity move do you not think to offer them to the early achievers first 
rather than, rather than it being like a, a kick in the teeth saying, well, you can't have your game, but you can buy it. I think um, some of them have said we, we, we would have really, you know, we'd have gone for that. And why wasn't it done? Well, I honestly uh, didn't expect that people uh, would do that. And the other thing was that I was on, on a pretty tight schedule to, to meeting a deadline uh, for, um, for the payment because th- there was a deadline. Mm-hmm. And, and and this was, yeah, I think the only option to to do it as fast as we needed to do it, because obviously if if yeah, we would have been uh, dealing with uh, individuals instead of you know one party to to buy buy all games, it would have taken a lot more time and effort to do so. Okay, and and you, I honestly being, didn't didn't expect that. that, that no? I mean, it, it didn't it came to my head that, that I that, that that was an option. I I'm, right. I just thought no, that nobody would do that. So, uh, and then of course, yeah. Well, uh, I can't say anything I want about it. It's not what happened. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So in hindsight, you might think it's a, oh that could have been a good idea, but at the time, yeah, if you didn't think of it. Yeah. Then okay. So. And and there's, I mean, from that, I mean, you can understand. I well, I can understand your the, the plan that you've got and how it could easily be seen as the like the only way that realistically you're going to get these games built and delivered to early achievers. But there has been a a vociferous backlash against the sale of these machines. These forty that were uh, in the forty complete games. Um, with people getting, you know, incredibly upset that their game is being sold to somebody else. Um, what, what can you say to them uh, to, to try and, you know, um, to, to help them? Un- well, I'm sure they understand what your plan is, but to to give them some kind of confidence that, that this is actually something that's going to lead to them getting their game. Okay. Yeah, I know there is backlash. I, I haven't received it personally, but of course I'm. I don't read pen site, but I get uh, messages uh, uh, from from other people who read it. Mm-hmm. So personally, to me, there was from all the emails I received in the in the, in the past couple of months, uh, uh, also from people who know what we were doing. Uh, I didn't get. Um, uh, well, s- stuff thrown at me as they were doing on. Um, the forums yeah and yeah what can i say i mean <laughs> I, I, let me say this I, I i spoke to a lot of people who wanted to invest in dutch pinball because they think uh, dutch pinball uh, made uh, an amazing pinball machine and uh, i didn't i mean there were people who were throwing air quotes millions at me to to uh, to buy the company and to continue with us building the games and almost every one of them told me we first go bankrupt mm. we cut the eas and then we start building games again without the legacy or however yeah. you want to call it yeah and i said no i don't want to do that i mean i will do everything i can in my power to uh, build uh, Dutch Pinball up again, build new games, build all the Achiever games, and finally um, deliver. Deliver, and it, it will take some time, and it's going to be much more complicated than than the easy way out. But I I promise something, and if I promise something, I want to keep my promise, and I want to want to do uh, the right thing. And I know it's it's. I mean, maybe some people think I'm crazy, <laughs> and and people think it's it's not doable or whatever. Well, okay, that that's that's that's. Uh, I mean, that might be still be true. I mean, I don't know what what the next month will uh, will do or what we uh, what more problems we can get. I th- I don't think we can get into more problems than we already had. So, <laughs> um, and we will just start slowly producing games again in the next couple of months and and slowly ramp up and this time we won't be using any contract manufacturer we're gonna uh, build a production facility ourselves and we're just gonna start from there right okay let's let's have a look at those plans a little more, little more detail because you you haven't got the parts yet have you 
No, I was uh, there last Friday to prepare everything for shipment. You know, right. you, just yeah. to, to check everything was right on the pallet and, and, and just counting the pallets and stuff like that. And we have now planned for this week to do all the transport or, or uh, at least uh, a few. So so where, where are you taking these? Do you have a... Um, are they going to a storage facility? Do you have somewhere which is going to eventually be the place you plan to make games? They are going first to a storage facility really close to my home. Uh, also the place where we uh, did that, the, the uh, how you say, the, the 40 games project. <laughs> and um, we, I, I, just today I agreed upon uh, hiring, how you say that, leasing or hiring yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a building. Mm-hmm. And I think it will be ready for us in two weeks because there is another company in there and they, they need a few weeks to, to get uh, their, their stuff out. <laughs> Wait a and minute. So you're forcing another company to move? <laughs> <laughs> no, they were very happy with me because they had a five-year lease. <laughs> and now they, now they can get out of it. So, <laughs> so they're, pretty, uh, they're actually pretty happy that we uh, wanted to hire that building because they, uh, they wanted to move to a bigger place. But of course, they had stuff there, so they needed time to uh, to get everything out. Okay, right. So, and, and, okay. Sorry, you know, carry on. Uh, okay, and and so we are picking up the parts, and we are doing. Uh, we have a uh, inventory count, I assume. Exactly, and we can do that at, at the place at the warehouse where we're placing them first, and they are like right around the corner where our new place will be. So that's going to be pretty easy. I, I would guess you can't really develop your plans or any kind of a time scale on this until you know what it is you've got and exactly. what, and what you need to what you need to order and what the lead times on those are. Um, but if you haven't got if you're missing you know parts and it's probably quite reasonable judging by the the lean ordering process that you were saying that ARA use that your uh, they were they were um, ordering parts as they needed them so mm-hmm. there will be a a number of them which are, are missing for well, building games in any quantity you're saying uh, order them and i mean in 20s or 30s at a time well yeah. assume assume that oh, i guess i assume the worst and assume they haven't got any of them and they've all been used up because uh, they used all the ones that they had and, and they didn't order any more then are you going to be able to order new parts for, to build games from parts manufacturers from stockists are you are you, have you will people work with you to do this yeah yeah <laughs> well that's a good question and yes people will work with me with me i i in the last few weeks i contacted almost every supplier we we used in, in building those games most of them are, are local and after i spoke uh, when i spoke to them there were all really happy that that we we get started again because um, most of the suppliers for parts uh, were uh, found by me. Of course, ARA did some uh, did some buying as well, but some of the you know really specific parts were uh, part suppliers were found by by me myself. So, and, and, and what about I, the parts that ARA made? Yeah, that, so that's mostly sheet metal and, and PCB work. And I have a few alternatives for them. Or a, e, even maybe ARA. Really? You work with them again? As a part supplier? Hmm. I, I don't see why not. So, okay. Yeah, um, it might be <laughs> difficult to understand, but when I was with Barry at ARA... Um, um, everybody in the factory was really happy to see Barry and uh, the the... Um, there was no animosity or anything, and people were really friendly. And and so, uh, if people are expecting that there is any, um, um, how do you call it, bad blood between uh, Barry and uh, uh, the people on the floor at ARA, I didn't see any. It was just a, a legal management issue. It was nothing. It had nothing to do with people that that worked at ARA. But people were reluctant to work on our products and they were really happy uh, when they saw me again yes and, and also last week they were also uh, very very nice to me and and they helped me and 
it was all it, it was like like all the bad things never happened sure really. if, you, if you were if you were contracted with them to supply parts you'd be dealing with their management legal again though wouldn't you yeah, but that would be just parts, you know. That 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 would be just super simple uh, supplier uh, buyer thing. I mean, that would be just like you know, I, I need ten aprons. Uh, wh- what are they going to cost, and when are they ready? No assembly, no no difficult mm-hmm. stuff. So, <laughs> but it's I, nothing. I, it's nothing that that we are have decided yet. It's just something that is sure. on the table. So that's just. I mean, I have other suppliers too. As for for PCBs, it's, it's really easy. You know, you can go everywhere. And, and and sheet metal, there are a lot of alternatives too, which I also talked to in the, in the past years. You know, when we are looking for alternatives. Sure, but it, it wouldn't be unreasonable though to to expect them to require a certain amount of payment up front for the for these products, or payment in advance for uh, for manufacturing them. <laughs> you think? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm sure work gets around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, they're fine. Does, does your, Maybe does your next year. Plan, I mean, you, you don't know what's missing. I, I guess we have to put that out there. So you don't know what the cost is going to be to produce a well, produce enough parts to make complete games yet. I did a pretty good analysis of the of the list we had, and, and then there were some parts missing, which I uh, where I was sure of they they would be there. So last Friday we did so a, a pretty good. Uh, analysis of everything that was there because now we really had the time to right. uh, okay. the last time we were there to, to pick up the games and some other parts we were just there for that and it was also in the vacation from ARA so we didn't have any time to to open up boxes and, and look at all the stuff and that's what we did on Friday so now I have an even more uh, idea of what is there and I did a quick analysis and I think we're uh, uh, what what I saw and what I've written down now it makes me makes me very happy. I think we uh, the first games uh, won't be a problem. I think it's it's really feasible that that you know we're just buying some parts uh, for the first I don't know twenty five fifty games is uh, it's not that bad. Right. Okay. So we got we got two two other very important strands. The, the, the second one we're coming to in a minute, which is actually how you're going to build games. But as part part of this plan, I have to keep coming back to the early achievers and the and the well, 130 machines which are still owed. And what? Uh, how many machines do you have to build? Because I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that the first machines you're going to build, you're going to sell. Okay, you're not going to be in a position to give those to early achievers because you need to need to get up to speed, need to get the manufacturing going, need to be ordering parts, need to start. I don't know. You might need to be start paying back your investors at some point. So there's there's cash flow that needs to be happening before you can start producing games that don't bring you in any money. Yes. What's your what's your plan? What's your time scale? Well, no, not time scale. What's your production number? Where you think you will be able to a start or and b complete the the um, the pre-orders from the early achievers? Yeah, I'm still I'm still working on on the detailed cal- calculation on that. Of course, I did some 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 estimations and and some uh, Excel work on that. And so I think the sweet spot is going to be somewhere between four or five hundred games. And <laughs> Four or five hundred games. By which time, all the early achievers will have their machines. Yes, I think it's going to be somewhere in that area. Right. So we're looking at around about um, one early achiever machine for every two retail machines, shall we say? So you'll sell two, and one will be an early achiever machine, but but not in that order. Right. Yes. So in the beginning, of course, we have to uh, use a lower ratio for that. Yes. And 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 while we progress, we have to to scale up. And and how exactly that will t- turn out, I don't know yet. I mean, and that's something uh, uh, we also j- just you know. J- <laughs> I mean, we we can make all the calculations we want. In in the end, you know how, how things like that go. I think yes. uh, for now, 
I think the most important thing is that we just start building. And, and, and do you think do you think there's a market for 500 more Lebowskis? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, even at twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Well, those sold out of in, in, in a few minutes. You told me so. <laughs> mm, yeah, but that well, there was a good reason for that, though, because people thought they might be the only chance they ever get to, to own one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I think I think there is. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's move on to how to you you plan to build these. Okay. You you've identified a facility. You've got you've got a bunch of parts to build the first. Well. You got most of the bunch of parts to build the first hundred games. Is that a reasonable number of how many near complete sets of, uh, uh, of machine parts you have? Uh, I, I honestly, at this point, I can give. I don't want to give any number on that. Okay. Some parts either for two hundred games, some parts for twenty, some parts for fifty. I mean, I really have to uh, do a better analysis before I can give an actual number because I don't want to, you know. Uh, uh, create expectations. Yeah, create expectations that that can be met. Yes. Okay. So you, but you've got a number of parts built, a number of games, um, and you'll all order the parts that you don't have. How are you going to build these games? Are you going to employ people to build these games? Are you going to you going to build them all yourself? Um, yeah, I'm going to build them all myself. <laughs> I will be done in 2031. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, well, no, that's no. why I didn't ask you for a time scale. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to give it a, 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 a planning yet. As soon as as, as we can say a, a, anything about planning and 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 dates uh, when games will be released, I, I will. But uh, first, we will start small with a, with a. Uh, yeah, I, I will be working on them myself uh, in the beginning. Uh, also, you know, just to check if everything. Uh, is is going well, you know, and and if the, the the assembly instructions are correct, and maybe you know to adjust them. So the first games will be built by by me and, and Gus. Uh, he's there as well. Um, <coughs> and, Sorry, who, who else is there? Uh, uh, Hus. Oh, okay. Gus, <laughs> mm-hmm. my dear friend and and colleague, mm-hmm. and also. Uh, one of the only pers- persons besides me who knows every little screw and detail of of the of the game, and uh, also in the, in the beginning we will have some help from uh, some people who want to help. So so that's nice as well, and we will slowly ramp up and you know hire people and and slowly start a new business, restart right. business. Yeah, but um, one of the things I keep hearing is or keep thinking about all the things you're saying is this is going to cost money no it's going to cost money to get a factory it's got to get money to transport or everything it's going to cost money to build the games you've got to tool everything up you know in order okay you might have rotisseries but you've got to have all the tools there you've got to you've got to employ people eventually mm-hmm. um you've got to well things don't go perfectly you know things go wrong things have to be sent back there's might be people sitting around for a long time waiting for parts to arrive all this is money are you well, can you assure people who are listening to this that the funding is there in order to see this project through? Yes, yes, the, the, the funding is there to, to see this project through. But I can't guarantee anything, of course. But uh, um, the plans uh, that are uh, in place now, I'm sure that we can pull it off. Okay, I don't. I don't think I have any more questions. I was going to leave that. Leave that as a potential end point. But um. <laughs> no, I, actually, I thought it was a very uh, 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 interesting uh, pause. <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting pause. I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, you probably expected me to say more. But, but yeah, what, what can I say? I mean, uh, I I've been thinking about this for years. I. I mean, I, there were literally points in, 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 the, in the past year or months that it was never going to happen again. Um, and I, I, know, I know people are, are waiting for ages uh, to get games. 
Well, some people might still be waiting for ages. Uh, by your estimation, that that <laughs> just heard. But yeah, yeah, that, that that was of course. Okay, <laughs> let me explain. It was a joke. <laughs> um, no, I think the best uh, what my target is for uh, finishing all of the early achiever games is before the end of next year. Wow, that's optimistic. Yeah, well. That's, we said four to five hundred games, so that's going to be um, about. <laughs> just doing some quick maths. Um, that's going to be about uh, five or six a week. Is that is that right? Yeah, an average. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably more than that. Actually, if it was if it was ten a week. It'd be five hundred in a year, assuming no holidays. And um, so yeah, probably running about 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 eight on average of eight machines a week over that time scale that's mm-hmm. um which is i mean that's getting on for the maximum that um that the ara thought they were going to be able to build at, at 10 yeah i think it can be much faster yeah okay um and w- what about um things like you know service and support for these games How, how's that going to be handled um who's who's going to be able to do that and, and spare parts and uh and all the other boring stuff that has to happen when once you've shipped a game. Yeah, well, that's that's of of course something uh, we also thought about, and of course we we need uh, uh, extra parts for support and, and and stuff like that. But like I said, we're going to start sl- slowly. Uh, we, I'm not going to hire 20 people tomorrow and 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 start producing 30 games a week. Um, so we're going to start slowly. We're going to build up. Everything like like that. Of course, I, I still do uh, some support already, uh, but that's of course uh, pretty easy. Uh, and and of, of course, uh, people who, uh, can help me with that. Also, you know, with with um, the distribution of parts, uh, I'm gonna uh, how you say it. I'm gonna work together with with uh, people in the U.S. who will uh, deal with that as well. Right. That's what I was going to ask you. Are you selling? You're going to be selling these games through. Distributor, or well, selling them selling them directly. Um, f- well, in the US, they will be handled uh, exclusively by uh, CoinTaker, right? And in Europe, they will be distributed by us. Dutch pinball. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, almost, almost, almost thought you've forgotten the name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We thought about it, and 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 mm-hmm. we said, yeah, well, in, in Europe, and and also the the rest of the world, it's it's going to be uh, uh, easier if we do it ourselves. But because in the end, you know, when when there is something wrong with the games, or we need to, there has to be dealt with support and stuff like that, they will probably come to us anyway. So, okay, um, I uh, don't have any more questions, but I, uh, unless Jonathan does, I would like to. Oh, I do. Ask you one. Oh, okay. I'll let you do that, and I'll I'll pitch in my final question then. Right. Okay. So um, these uh, uh, forty games that were recently uh, sold to um, uh, new customers, so to speak, um, some of the early achievers were kind of uh, surprised to see that um, uh, they could understand that you would uh, um, that, that you sold the game. Uh, but you also shipped the, uh, the the early achiever rug that was an exclusive for original early achievers uh, with these games as well, and that sort of uh, struck some people. Um, you know, they, they were like, "No, oh, why are you giving those away to people that should not be entitled to get those?" Is there anything you want to say about that, or was there a reasoning behind it? Mm. I can't remember that it was always 100% exclusive for for early achievers, but I, I don't know. I, I might have said it somewhere. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know at this point. Um, do you know? Is, is it something I said or we said? Um, I'm currently going by my memory. So I <laughs> thought the, uh, the rug was um, only going to be part of um, something. That yeah, for... Really... F- 
Therefore, probably for achieved. free. Yeah. Oh, oh free. That, that could be the case. Yeah. I think. I think. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sorry, but I think it was never truly exclusive. But it was like like uh, the the Chrome and uh, uh, upgrade. It was something that would that early achievers would get for free. Right. Yes, uh, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and um, of course, with you um, taking the game. Um, into production. Um, recently, we saw a price increase um, on on the games that um, that sold. Um, but once you're back into production and um, uh, offering uh, games, is there any chance uh, that the, the 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 current price of twelve thousand five hundred is that going to be the new price, or is there going to be Something like a pro version as well, where some of the elements are uh, stripped from the game and you come up with a cheaper model? It is something we're thinking about, but at this point we have not made a decision yet, so I don't know. Okay. So, um, so um, when do you expect to be starting to uh, building the first new Big Lebowski's? As soon as possible. <laughs> I, I can give exact planning at this uh, point. Uh, obviously, you have to do your inventory first, get the parts in, store the parts in a, in a, in a, in a manner of which is practical so that you have easy access to them and so on. And then, Yeah, of course, I work on plans of that as well. You know, uh, I, I didn't, yeah, you know me a little bit, but you know, I know I'm, I'm always very practical if it comes to stuff like this. And I, I take the... The floor plan of the building, and I'm I'm going to start thro- uh, drawing in 3D how the production process is going to take place, and of course, so I'm working on that. So I think uh, because of this practical approach, I think we can be in in production pretty pretty fast. And of course, and I, I've already done the, this uh, several times. <laughs> mm. So uh, yeah, and and no pre-orders this time. <laughs> no pre-orders this time. Right. Okay. Um, I guess um, we'll move on to uh, Martin's final question then. Yeah, I, I just um, I wanted uh, to give you the opportunity to just to to say a few words to to two groups of people really. Um, firstly, um, to those early achievers who have been waiting patiently for for many years. Um, or at least a couple of years um, to get their games. Um, what can you say to them and give them give them realistic hope that they will get those games in uh, in the not too distant future? You know, if, if plans come together by the end of next year. And uh, to those people who who are thinking of buying the game now, um, what what can you say to them? You know, who who want to buy want to be in on the uh, on buying a, a new retail game. Uh, from your new production run, uh, what's um, what's your sales pitch to them about uh, <laughs> wow. about what, about why they should and, um, and 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 what what their purchase would mean for the uh, for the company and for uh, everyone involved? Okay, well, I never needed a sales pitch for Lebowski before, so <laughs> I haven't got one uh, <laughs> uh, right here. But, but I I, I want to say, of, of, of course, uh, a few things. So what I want to say to the to the early achievers and of course uh, other people, well, I know the the last past years they've been waiting on games are you know uh, th- that was that sucked really, and but I always had some hope that it would in the end you know eventually uh, work out. I'm like I said before I'm I'm pretty positive I always see possibilities. I I don't. Give up easy. I think everybody sees that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, like I said before, uh, I mean, our company was, you know, uh, so close uh, to bankruptcy. And I think that, that this happened. Uh, and then the future we are now facing is, I think, it's something good. I mean, I know there are people uh, with lots of negativity. And of course, it could go wrong in the end as well but um, at this point I think you know I'm in 100% control of the company there are no more lawsuits I don't have any manufacturer to to uh, to talk to when when things need to be done 
it's all in my hands now, and I know that um, that I can do this. And of course, I mean, it, uh, we we will we need to show it to people, and we will. You're currently in the process of of basically building up Dutch Pinball again as a uh, in a, in in a new form as a manufacturer and as a distributor. Um, for the in in the uh, near foreseeable future, you'll be building um, Big Lebowski's, um, but will there be other games as well? Yes, we of course now in the, in the next few months and maybe years we will focus on TBL only, uh, building as as much games and selling as much games as we can. But it's not it's not going to stop at Lebowski. I like we uh, we had planned before you know making making new games and it's still something that we we want to do build new games completely new new games for right. years to come right so at some point obviously like you said you'll be um uh, starting out the uh, assembly of the uh, Lebowski's yourself uh, also to make sure that the whole process is documented properly and that yes. you can hand it over to uh, other people but at some point, you'll be designing a game number two. Yeah. And three, exactly. and four, and five. And so on, yeah. Okay, well, that's yeah. promising, especially if game number two will be as exciting as The Big Lebowski, because um, it has to be said that, personally, I can only speak for myself, but I think with Lebowski, you really uh, managed to, to create a not only a very exciting pinball machine, but also with a very, very good theme integration. Um, so I'm very curious to see what else, what other games you you might come up with. Yeah, I'm sure I can surprise everyone. <laughs> good. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed, Barry, for uh, joining us on this uh, special joint Pinball Magazine Pinball News podcast. I think it's been a, an enlightening discussion and conversation you're welcome um, i think it's uh, i think everybody will wish you the best in your endeavors and i don't think anybody well hardly anybody would uh, would not want to see you producing big lebowski's and and other games long into the future um so uh, we'll wish you the best of luck and uh, and let's get those uh, early achievers their games as soon as we possibly can as well so thank you uh, that is that is the mission i mean that is that is the only thing i'm still doing this i mean if if there were no early achievers i was probably thrown a town uh, maybe years ago but they are the main, main reason i'm still doing this and they are uh, the guys that need their games and I want to thank them for the trust and the patience. And I will do everything in my power to get the games. And of course, I'm, I'm feeling, feeling really sorry for how uh, things went. But yeah, well, what can I say? It's, it's not like I planned it like this. I mean, no. our war death scenario was pretty good. But uh, yeah, well, due to circumstances, it did work out. And, and now we're here. And now there's still hope. And now let's see if we can pull it off. Well, I, I think uh, a lot of people don't realize that it was either the current scenario or it was nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, right. And, and I think we were very close to nothing. I think I, I think if you would have told uh, um, past six months, Barry, that that we would be here right now, that I would have laughed. That I wouldn't. That I wouldn't believe it. Right. No, I, I remember talking to you the day that you, uh, um, well, you remember, um, I yeah. helped you uh, rewrite that newsletter that was supposed to go out informing people on Yap's uh, illness and leaving the company, and that you were almost at the, uh, at the end of your rope, but you still had a few days to consider whether to appeal or not against the court yeah. ruling. That's, and yes. that same afternoon, you sort of stuff out with Ara. Yeah. So. It was really bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's so strange the way things suddenly work out when you're least expecting them. Right. Exactly. So, mm. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Barry. That was uh, very entertaining and uh, and informative. Uh, we will be back, Jonathan and I, will be back at the end of September this month with a look back at everything that's, that's gone on in the in the pinball world over the, uh, the past month. And uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty more to be, uh, to be said about uh, Dutch pinball and the Big Lebowski very, very soon. Right. And um, just as a reminder... Um, if you want to read about the history of Dutch pinball up to the point where things started to go into the wrong direction, um, there's actually a, quite an in-depth article on them in uh, Pinball Magazine number four, um, also with um, interesting artwork and, and, and stuff like that. So um, if, you, if, if you're really into that, then uh, by all means, um, make sure to order Pinball Magazine number four. And like Martin said, we'll be back at the end of uh, September with a new podcast. I expect we're going to be hearing a lot more from Dutch Pinball. Um, I'm very happy with how this podcast went and um, uh, hope you appreciate it as well. Uh, I'm very happy also that Barry uh, was willing to take uh, two hours uh, of his time to uh, enlighten us and, and the rest of the world on on what went down um hopefully uh you can appreciate it as much as we do so uh that's it for now um i'd say bye-bye for now and yep. until the end of the next yep. month yeah we'll see you then bye-bye <laughs>